Hello, and welcome to The Fool and the Philosopher. The Philosopher and the Fool. Hello. Hello. Right, so you've been reading... Uh, Atlas Shrugged. Atlas Shrugged, and you had some yeah, thoughts on it. Yeah, so it's a book about trains, which I never knew. All right. Did you know that? I did yes. not. So... I thought it was about unions. It is about unions, but it's also about trains. The main character... Um, or one of the main characters is th- th- basically runs a railroad and uh, she's having a really hard time of running a railroad because everything's being socialized and it's making her life hell trying to run a system because everyone keeps like taking away her resources and she can't get the railroad running because it has to be equally distributed amongst everyone. And while this is going on, like there's a problem with this train line and there's a bunch of businesses going kind of out of business, a guy comes up with a new kind of metal alloy, which is twice as light as steel and twice as strong. And so this is like ridiculously good stuff. And she wants to make new rail carts out of it. Be- I mean, not rail carts, uh, just rails out of it. T- yeah, rail ties. ties and not just ties, but like the whole tracks. She wants to yeah. make them out of this um, metal called reared in metal. And it's also cheaper than steel to make. So it's like incredibly good stuff. And there's just a whole bunch of problems. Like uh, they can't get anyone to um, make her. Well, the first problem is everyone thinks this metal is bogus because the science department has said it's bogus in the um, government. And they said, oh, it will shatter. And any weight that goes on it, anyone who's on that train will get killed. And so they're saying, like, you're just selfish trying to make this. You're just trying to make a quick few bucks. And. She's always being told that she's selfish, and she is. She She's in it to make money, but people are always accusing her of just trying to make quick money, and she wants to make a running system that can keep making her money. She wants to have an investment, and then the whole time, like, they're just struggling to get this thing happening. A bunch of people go of business. Like, originally, they wanted to order metal, and the people who were supposed to give her the railroad uh, tracks had, were, like, six months late because they weren't getting the iron to make steel and convert it over. And that's because all the good uh, iron mines had gone out of business. And then the guy who made the super metal also has really good mines and he like figured out a way to get mines. So he's basically like self-sufficient running. So buying from him is probably the best thing you can do. And then there's just people like anyone who has a good business, they just seem to be disappearing. Like they quit for no reason and say it's a personal matter and then they stop running their business. And these are like really important people and it keeps happening. As it progresses, um, worse and worse things happen to the companies. One of them is the um, anti-dog eat dog rule gets passed and that stops like uh, weird competition in trains. So the the train people can't compete with each other as much, so you're not allowed to monopoly. Um, And then there's another law that gets passed, which is the equalization of something or other. I can't remember exactly what it's called, but it um, stops you from owning more than one business. So you're only allowed one business. And this is a pretty big law that affects a lot of people, but the one guy who made the metal is... um, his whole thing's under like his ownership of reared and steel. And so he's still fine, but it's caused like a lot of people to go to business. And then there's another law that's passed, which makes it so you're only allowed to own one kind of business. So if you're in the metal making it, if you're um, making steel, you're only allowed to make steel. If you're making car parts, you're only allowed to make car parts. So it's basically allow the little guy to get a chance so he can have business. And then so Reardon can't own coal, mi- coal mines anymore, and he can't own the uh, iron mines anymore. So he has to sell his business to other people and then try to set up deals with them, but they're not as good as running the whole thing as them, as him. And so it's just causing like a ton of problems for everyone. And good business people keep on disappearing. And the government's like passing more and more laws and forcing more and more things on these business owners who are just trying to make money. But the whole country is now breaking down around them. And I guess another part of background to it is the United States is the only place left in the world that isn't communist. Okay. And so basically her thought is like, um, well, my thoughts on I'm not through the whole series yet, but I have a little knowledge of it is um, basically all the people who are good in business or competent 
are quitting because they see this like socialism government takeover of everything they own. And so they're just stopping the industry right now so the government can't seize it. And they're ending their businesses so the government can't seize it. And they're basically like destroying the whole government beforehand because all basically all the confident people are quitting. It sounds like a kid's yeah. story, like a, 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 a I don't, what would it be, the 70s or 80s kid's story, like this sort of, and the nasty communists will try to reg- restrict capitalism, and if you do, everything will go horrible with no benefit. Well, it's basically, um, a way to look at it is, um, like, it's very r- well written in some ways, so it's um, basically how, uh, what is it called, uh, 1984, right? It like yeah. the the first uh, three part the first two parts of the book are basically the descent into 1984. Yeah, well, it sounds a lot like a book like 1984, yeah. like a, a propaganda yeah. piece. To well, not propaganda. I was talking to someone mm-hmm. about this idea. Uh, he would listen to the podcast. Actually, yeah. sorry. he listened to the podcast and he said he thinks stories can be a useful way to convey an idea, like Animal Farm yeah. in 1984. I agree. I don't think they're stories. I think they are. They're like moral lessons or Aesop's fables or they're lessons. I think they're, it's a useful way to transmit a yeah. lesson, but I don't think they are exploring an idea as much. I think they still do like sometimes, but or, you have to give the other side its due or, or, or your, uh, your story is just showing. Like the government doesn't just make re- legislation to be. Yeah, evil. no, they, it's, they, um, they, so all the. Man, the, a lot of these characters are conceited, and some of them is just the, like the way they are. But basically, it's like we have to do what's best for everyone. Like it's not that they're being evil; it's like they're basically being super socialist. Right, but once everything goes wrong, well, you think the someone well, will what happens is when things go wrong, they're just um, blaming the uh, big, like they're blaming people quitting. Like, oh, why do these people quit? There's no longer anyone competent left in the world. Why can't we get any good engineers? And they're blaming like the big uh big businessmen as like they're somehow working around the system and just taking all the money for themselves and then quitting so it's like they keep each time they try to fix something they make things worse then they blame the people who were running everything and then they try to make it so the system will make things better and it makes things worse and then they blame those people and keep hurting them over and over again so i think if you had a character that was how did you do it? If the good guys are all good and the bad guys are all bad, I don't think you're writing a story okay. about that. Yeah, that's fair enough. The the good guys have their own problems. Also, the um, the hero of the story, he's been mentioned a ton, but he hasn't like had a single line yet written about him saying anything or revealed that he's doing anything yet. So the hero, uh, Peter, nope, or something? John Galt. Or? I can't. John Galt. Yeah, so yeah. John Galt, I was like a this is, yeah. I'm into basically Act 3 of the book, and John Galt still hasn't shown up. Yeah. Well, but he's he's probably doing his throat exercises for his Well, speech. yeah, uh, so people keep asking the question, who is John Galt? And it's like this throwaway statement, like, what is the world coming to? Oh, I don't know, who's John Galt? And so they'll keep saying this, and then people, a lot of people hate that statement, and it's like, who the heck is this guy? And then some people are like, I knew who John Galt was. He discovered the Fountain of Youth. And he wanted to bring it to the rest of the world, but he found out he couldn't because it's on the mountain. When you bring the water down, it doesn't go to anyone else. And so he lives up there still. And then another person's like, oh, I had a friend who um, knew someone who knew John Galt. He found Atlantis in the ocean. And the city was so pure that him and his whole crew all killed themselves because nothing could be as good in the world again, except for my one friend. And he lived and told me this story. And... um, so no one actually knows who John Galt is. However, he's um, currently works for the main character as just a lowly engineer. He's like a mythical. Yeah, he's a mythical figure. figure, and there's actually this. He's like nefarious. Yeah, bread. no, he's actually a lot like nefarious bread in some ways. Uh, there's another part where basically someone said, "I he had so one of his old teachers said he had so much potential, but he's probably dead now, and no one knows who he is." And then she's like, but everyone does know who he is. Everyone's always using his name. It's John Galt. So everyone knows who he is. It's just no one knows who he is. I guess. And basically, I think he's convincing the people. Like, 
I actually suggests at one point that he visited someone before they did the weird retirement and say it's a personal matter. So I think he's like going around and convincing all the confident people basically to quit for his grand revolutions. So, what do you think of the book so far? Is it worth a read? Uh, if it wasn't assigned to you, um, would you read it? At this, at this point. point, I would keep reading it. Because I want to see yeah. where the story goes. I want to see what happens. Would you recommend it to others? Um, I would recommend it um, if you go in... I would recommend it, but I recommend going into it, treating it as um, a fictional, like a science fiction dystopia book instead of a political book. Like, yeah. read it. So how I think you should write a book is you should write the story first and then have your message will show up in it, right? Yeah. Um, this book was written very well, but it was written to show the message and the stories that like just used to show the message. So I'd read it as if it was written the way you're supposed to write. <laughs> if you get that. So yeah. read it. At, Maybe. Read it as a story. Does it hold up as a yes, story? Yes, it does. Though? Because, uh, I don't know, sounds kind of Although, <laughs> Real, there's, and whatnot. Um, if you... I guess you can write a story um, on anything. Like, Pillars of the Earth is amazing, and that's about building a cathedral. So, I know that you um, got upset by the conceitedness of um, those people in The Name of the Wind, the women martial yeah. artists. Yeah, who are and, perfect. Uh, and the Warded Man. Yeah. Uh, the, what are they called? Like, the Air... Oh, the, the yeah, sand, sand people, people, how you hated them? <laughs> yeah, I forget their names, but they, they live so in the So, Ayn Rand's yeah. very good at writing people to despise. Yeah, I don't like it when authors She do is so good at it. Like, um, Unless it's it's a humorous thing like Terry Pratchett or something uh, where it's they're just meant to be annoying. Yeah, At no, I can like... So... My D&D characters are often despised. There's this um, one guy, he, he reared in, so he's the maker of the metal. And so he's incredibly wealthy and he takes care of his whole family. So he has his wife... His mother and his brother all live with him, and uh, hit, and they each one of them despises him in their own way, and he sees it as like his um, moral duty to support his family because it's what he wants to do, and so he has to support his family. And his mother wants to live with him, and she's always saying like he's not human. He's just like never cares about anyone. He's always at the business. He's never spending time with us. Um, he's Oh, he's so selfish. He never wants to help out his brother, and then his brother's incredibly incompetent and is always trying to have these charitable t causes that he's working for and trying to like donate money to. And he's saying, "Yeah, but you just won't understand that, would you? Like, you can't understand being kind and doing things for the social good." And so at one point, uh, Taggart goes to his brother and goes, "Okay, here, um, you you want money for this charity? Here, like, it's such a small amount for me. So here, have." ten thousand dollars for your charity and then his brother is angry at him for that saying you're just giving that money to me for me you don't care about this charity you're just trying to do it to make me happy and so it's and then his wife is always going oh he doesn't care about anyone that's his charm he's just trying to be important and take care of everyone that's just what he wants to do he wants to show how powerful he is and how strong and that's just our lot in life is living under his thumb because that's what he enjoys it's like a reverse straw man. Or yeah. Straw man. Like, no, like his, the whole family is horrible. And he's... Like an inverted And straw he's man. like, oh, but I should take care of my family. So that's what I'll do. And so he tries to do his best to take care of them. And he also kind of hates them, though. But then he's always mad at himself when he hates them. Because, it's, no, they're just upset that someone's taking care of them. And their points are valid. So I should listen to them. So I think a really good version of this although i haven't read uh, mm -hmm. atlas shrugged so i don't know but uh in malazan book of the fallen the city of Lethras, yes. that whole thing is like an argument against capitalism however in the end the hero is a capitalist yeah. and so it's like here are all the weaknesses of capitalism but it's still the best system is sort of the argument of that thing yeah and i i think that's a very uh like that's an interesting story it's like oh but these like, you go into it pro-capitalist, mm -hmm. probably, uh, given that most of the yeah. world is. And you're like, oh, but look at all these evils and this, like, you know, the assassinations and the business dealings and the and the corruption and all this. And then 
you're like, yeah, okay. I, I mean, I don't feel comfortable maybe because it challenges my ideas of this, but you see the negative side. But then the, the hero who destroys the capitalist system rebuilds it into another one that's stronger and better and less corrupt. And well, there's um, a point in the series where this guy called Wyatt, he runs the oil fields, and it's basically like the main oil field of the United States. And um, he says to people, if you screw me, I will destroy everything. Like he says, I'll basically do the same back to the whole country. And people are like, okay, that's a bit of a weird statement. And then they basically do screw up his business. A new, another law is passed, which is like, you're only allowed to produce a certain amount of any resource to limit it. So everyone gets to produce an equal amount of oil or whatever. So like you can only produce as much as the um, next best person can produce. And so he um, lights his oil field on fire and disappears. As the next best person can produce. So basically you can only produce oil as the yes, worst person. Yes, exactly. And so he... Yeah. Uh, you can he, definitely see her yeah. um, communist. Yeah, so there. he lights the oil field on fire and disappears. And then the whole the country heat. in the wintertime, everyone's like converting back to coal because they're running out of oil. And everyone was cold that winter and like power outages are constantly happening. Because his oil was basically running the country. It's like when the Russian government uh, told all the farmers that they had to stop farming and so the other people could do it. And they, they gathered them up into a different farming yeah. system. And just dis like starved like millions of people. And China did even worse and killed like... Oh, uh, the numbers are... I, I don't know. They're, they're too big to sound right if you say them. So. You are listening to The Fool and the Philosopher. So if communism's so bad, mm -hmm. why is the entire world communist, especially Romania? Uh, in the book? Yeah. Um, I don't know. It hasn't gone into that. That's a, that would be an, a cool idea to explore. Like, I haven't completed the whole book yet, but I, I feel yeah. possibly what... I just wonder if it yeah, happened. I right think if possibly was. what happened is maybe it's a world where, um, like the United States was very much against communism, but maybe the yeah. red tide basically overwhelmed the rest of the world. But why would it if once you saw that, oh, 50% of the countries are communist and 50% are failing, let's not adopt that. Why would you continue? Like, because um, you think it's the kind thing? Maybe, to do, maybe? yeah. Or, or the... possibly, um, Possibly it could be that um, in like all the countries basically flipped to communism at the same time, except the U.S. Yeah. And uh, she wrote this before the USSR fell or after? Um, I don't know. It took her like three years to write this book. So I really don't see Romania ever being communist again, <laughs> at least not for hundreds of hundreds of years. Like their national anthem think, is anti-communist. I think the book is based in, though... Um, it's based in like a dystopia, different thing that yeah. I think happened around the time of the communist revolution or a little afterwards. If a country can see how bad things were, then in your fantasy world, yeah, well, I would imagine. So be John resistance. Galt, right? One of the things he did early on in the story is he invented a ambient static collecting engine that could basically. It, so this is some pretty crazy science fiction stuff, but. It's basically a motor that collects the ambient static electricity and turns it into, um, what is it, working power? So you can basically make a motor run and it does it really... That was what... Uh, I think that was the idea of Tesla's mm. energy machine. Yeah, and it does it really efficiently. And so it only like need a small amount of fuel to basically get it running and then every once in a while you want to adjust it. And so it'd be insanely good and he abandons it because he realized that the world wasn't ready for it because it was like going towards a socialist thing and he needs to first do the um, social revolution before he can do the technological revolution. And so he abandons his project. Strange. You'd think that unlimited energy would actually help a communist society be potentially successful. Well, this was like um, four or five years in the past or something and things have like exponentially gotten worse in the series. He's so strongly against communism that he doesn't want to possibly give it 
the thing that could actually make it succeed. Yeah. I think the only reason, I think, I think personally that the only way communism can succeed is with infinite resources. Yes. At, at no cost. Mm-hmm. Like, and then everyone's artisans. And you have to allow room for people to still have creativity and not, basically it has to be a system where people don't have to yes. work. That's, uh, it has to be like the Federation and Next Generation. Yeah, which is... Not communist, but something like it. They're not communist, they're socialist. Yeah. You're uh, throwing a pencil around, by the way. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'll stop the leash. Yes. Stop. <laughs> sorry, I'm professional. Yeah. But yeah, the... the uh, I think, you know, yeah, it's, it's socialist. You have all your basic needs met because you can afford to easily, so yeah. why not? And then you can do whatever you want. And if you want something fancy, then you still have to pay for I, it. I think it's kind of funny that, like, this book that's so austere and, like, big and scary, because it is a big and scary book, um, has two really cool science fiction things in it, which is the Reardon Metal, which is, like, amazing. It's, like, super titanium. And uh, this engine that has, like, the potential to give unlimited energy. They're not like that out of there in a way. Like it's just a technological investment yeah. does happen. And Tesla, like I said, did have the uh, atmospheric energy harvesting plan, I believe. Mm. I yeah, could I, be think wrong it's, on this, um, I think it's actually like based on this of people tried to come up with this, but it never worked. But then this guy figured it out because he's a yeah. Superman. Yeah. yeah. Um, so does it go into her objectivism at all? Uh, I believe that's later on when the character has his 40 minute monologue. I could be wrong, but I think one of the key parts of, object- of objectivism is the only thing we can, s- the only world we can interact with is the world we see, therefore that is the world that exists. You are listening to The Fool and the Philosopher. Maybe I'll read Atlas Shrugged someday. I've got a lot of books I want to read first. Uh, and I also don't have the money for it. I also want, like, socks, which cost, like, $50 for some reason. I don't really want them at that price, but... Look for some... They're really good socks. Timberland socks uh, are amazing. Huh? You want socks that don't wear out on uh, you? Yeah, they're like... You know how darn yeah. tough, like, they, they don't... Like, they wear out, but not that mm-hmm. much, but... The Timberland socks are actually comfortable and they don't wear out. Yeah. Like, I do, darn tufts are way too warm and they're way too thick. Timberland is like, they're like slightly thicker than, uh, cotton socks, but they're stretchy so they fit really good and they're also like comfortable. Do you remember? And, like, really tough. I've never had a pair get Do you like, remember how Kyla would wear her darn tufts? Um, she, okay. yeah, she'd use them as shoes. <laughs> yeah, just to break them. Yeah. Yeah, I just find darn tufts are way too thick, and, and my they're not stretchy enough. My feet don't feel free. I have really fat feet, so most socks don't fit me anyways. I have to get, like, much yeah. bigger. I have to get socks, like, bigger than... I. Your feet are way bigger than mine, but I need socks that are bigger than yeah. yours. Because I think my feet have more volume well, than your feet. Definitely, possibly. you have fat feet. <laughs> my feet are, like... Like, feet have, like, a scale of width, and mine are the widest or higher <laughs> that they had at the start. Yeah. But for on their measure, they don't have shoes this width. It's just they have a measuring thing for feet, and mine are like. So fat. in the world of Atlas like, Shrug, though, I'm like wider than okay. I am. Long. In the world of Atlas Shrug, <laughs> yeah. you want to be able to get those Timberland socks because those are good quality products, and everything's breaking down. There's nothing good quality left anymore. Yeah, but th- there's really they're too expensive. So I'd like a communist <laughs> government to force the price to be set with the other sock prices, so I could buy them for like I could buy like twelve. Then they wouldn't bucks. make them anymore. <laughs> Well, but once, like, the quick switch before they catch on, like, I think there's some, you know, flipping communism on and off might not be a terrible thing. <laughs> well, no, that's what's happening is everyone's like, ooh, if communism is turned on, everyone's like, takes opportunity, and then, like, a few weeks later, they're like, oh, bugger. That's basically what's <laughs> happening in the book yeah. several times. It's just kind of short-sighted, like, ooh. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, if, like, if uh, any party out there, like, this goes into our politics thing, but... And any party out there wants to make uh, switches and overseas shipping cheaper, uh, just, uh, you know, you got my vote. <laughs> make overseas t- t- shipping free, somehow. <laughs> Subsidize yeah. it. 
just give me the money to pay for it. Like when you do taxes, just like, oh dear, it looks like you spent three hundred dollars in overseas shipping this year. <laughs> we'll give yeah. it to you. Where does that money come from? Who knows? Where does it come from? It comes from you. <laughs> taxes. It comes from the rich, rich people. It comes from people's. No, no, no. I don't want it to come from me. Take it from the people that have more money than me. Well, no, it does. Uh, Okay, so, when... The cool thing about taxes, right? Is It's kind of a weird thing, but taxes are sort of like a pseudo-communism. So... I don't think they are. No, 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 no. All right, so, 5% of, like, your paycheck, right? Is, like, $50. Um, Uh, Well, let's just go with this. 5% of Bill Gates' paycheck is a million dollars. Yeah. And so both these things then get combined together among tons of people, and then it gets all spread out again yeah. for everyone. It doesn't, though, because that's that's not how it... It's more of an, an investment system. It's kind of like a... Um, However, it gets spread out into bridges and healthcare and keeping police, keeping you safe. Yeah, so I, I would say it's actually more like a uh, stock portfolio. Mm where a bunch of different people contribute to buy stock and, and then the stock gets um, the d- dividends from the stock gets divvied up back amongst them. Uh, so you invest in health and then people can work more and then everyone makes more money and you invest in roads and people can get to work more and everyone makes more money. And so I don't think it's similar to communism at all. I think communism is about taking the labor rather the, like the fruits of the labor directly and distributing mm. them. Whereas this is more investment. Yeah. It's probably better to do it that way. Which is why a place like Sweden is one of the wealthiest countries on earth, and so is Norway. They're socialists, not communists, mm. and they're very anti-communist still. How, how does socialism work? Well, like uh, I said, yeah. you invest in your, your country instead of um, just say decide that you can control mm. everything. They still have very capitalist businesses yeah. and everything. It's just so they say you know what you're you do what you're doing mm-hmm. best, and we'll make it so you can do and, it. And yeah, of course, it gets a bit weird because then you say. Look, the people do things best, not the government. So now give us a big chunk of your money so that we can make a healthcare system because we can do healthcare better, question. But I think it's more to... We can s- centralization of funding. Yeah, so... I don't know, actually, because that is... It, it does sound like, oh, well, then getting rid of healthcare would be a good thing because then the people who are best at it can do it. But then you have... I, I think uh, Dan Carlin said something. He said... You know, you want you you don't want big government to destroy yeah. you, right? You don't want to take over and do everything, but you also need a little government to protect you from big business. So I think maybe there's something to be said for like the idea. I'm not saying that it it is the best outcome, but let's say a healthcare system. Uh, this way, everyone can get it, and so you're not just like a company is not bidding. They're like, well, if we raise the price by ten percent, we will lose one percent of our customers. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's worth it yeah. to us. Whereas the government might have a slightly worse system, but at least it gets to everyone. Sometimes. So so it's like, which trade-off do you want? And is that actually fair to either side? So I'm not entirely sure, actually. Oh, no, we're yeah. talking policy. Well, we're not... I, I guess so. Well, I'm making but, a joke because, like, yeah. no talking politics. So like, oh, no, we're talking policy. Yeah, I, I guess this is the truth Yeah, politics, this is more yeah. politics than... Politics. <laughs> what people call yeah. politics, which just tends to be philosophy and ideology. Yeah. So, speaking of ideology, so uh, I have I have another argument for free speech. Like, there's yeah. a lot of them, and they're pretty obvious. But so extremism, I think, is a form of mental illness. Like, it, it isn't good for them. It isn't good for the people around them. And a, a mental illness is something that affects your life. Yeah. That is it. So I think extremism is a mental illness. Now. I haven't looked up any studies on this, so I could be totally wrong. But from anecdotal evidence, mental illness isn't cured by shame. For example, someone eats a lot and they're like super overweight. If you just say, hey, fatty, stop eating, it doesn't stop them. Like they just feel more shame and they eat more and then they feel bad about it and it just feeds on itself. (laughs) And it just uh, is a reciprocating cycle. Yeah, it's a a positive feedback. (laughs) Uh, That's why I said reciprocating cycle. So it just keeps going on and on. So if you have, so say, so shame doesn't work, right? Basically. Yes. So if you uh, tell people you can't have those ideas, then you are shaming them. And then you can't get them to help. And then you don't eliminate extremism. You just 
um, you, you, you make it a shame and you make it feed on itself because they don't understand me. And there's no arg- way to argue against it. And, uh, so yeah, uh, free speech? speech? So, oh, because uh, you have to let people speak freely. Or they, like, if you, if you get rid of free speech, you're like, I don't like these ideas, so you mm. can't say them. That's not going to stop those ideas from existing. Uh, it's, it's just going, going to make, make a positive they... feedback loop of the sickness. And then there's... Yeah, so it's going to make it so that you can't, you can't discuss them. And someone like, um, you know, like yeah. Socrates, right? He, uh, he disagreed a lot with the state, and so they, they had yes. him killed. Maybe Socrates' ideas were wrong, but he was pointing out the problems. And even if his solutions aren't correct, talking about the problems uh, does maybe help you get to a place... Like, you need people to deviate from the path... So that you can make sure that you're on the right yeah, path. Yeah, it's like evolution and mutation. And you aren't on the right... Yeah, You aren't on the right path. Like, you definitely aren't on the right path. You can't be on the right path. The right path is the path of movement. And and you need people to take you off of it, otherwise you deviate. Like, you're walking in a straight line and that's great, but the path is... It has to curve and you don't know which way it's going to yeah. curve. It's, it's, it's the end And it's the bits there. You, yeah, you, you need to allow the extremists to have their voice and to be talked so to. They so they can walk the just... path. So they can keep walking on the stair, yeah, even they if they're going down. Or at least they can show you yeah. the sides. They, they're they like the handrail. The, the infinite stair is railed. Well, with I, I think um, the infinite stair has ups and downs. And um, even if you're going down, you're still walking on the stair. And that's important because eventually a down will lead to an up. Yeah, if you if you just stop, then you, that's yeah. where you have trouble. Or if you just walk in a straight line and walk yeah, off. Yeah, if the you stairs. stop or walk off the stairs, <laughs> but, then you're but, doomed. But if the extremists are shut down, then they they don't have anyone to talk to, and their ideas are um, you can, you can't like I said, you can't cure mental illness with shame. I don't know if that's true, but it, it seems to be what I've heard. And, and then the extremists become fanatics. They yeah, they have no reason to. Uh, they're like, well, if. If what I was saying was nonsense, then why are they so afraid of the ideas? What what idea is... This idea is so powerful that idea? they have to stop it. What wrong idea is so powerful that you are afraid yeah. of it? Or, well, from their mind, it's like, what idea is... So, like, my idea is so powerful, they have to stop me from saying it. Which means, this idea is so powerful, it must be true. Yeah. And it could just be nonsense. But you they But if it's nonsense, then why are they... Why do they want to shut it down? And then you get yourselves, uh, as we said, fanatic, and those are extremely dangerous. Yeah. Fanatics uh, are speaking... the like, most dangerous things in the world. So maybe you'll cut this, but... So I saw this thing, it was uh, an article from some newspaper, I don't remember yep. which country, uh, but it was saying that the insane clown posse should be- lead the charge against incels and become an in- anti-incel movement. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So, so incel means involuntary. Sorry, what's the insane right? clown posse? Okay. Right. So, if incel means involuntary ce- yeah. celibate, then leading the charge against incels, becoming anti-incels, would that make you a nymphomaniac? Um, because how else do you get rid of incels? <laughs> well, I think we've <laughs> talked about this before, and the opposite is not always the solution. But, but how do you get rid of involuntary you, celibate? You, all right, so involuntary celibate. So, you oh, need a, it's, so it's, a, it's a nymphomaniac movement. All right, movement. So, so get rid of involuntary cel. How do you get rid of involuntary? Sorry, I was thinking about voluntary you, cells. What are those called? MGTOW? Yeah, no, MGTOW no, no. are the voluntary or whatever. But, no, no, no. You, you see yeah. what I'm saying? <laughs> you need a bunch of, like, nymphomaniacs or something. Yes. Um... Anyway, it's just a dumb <laughs> thing. I just read the article just before we started, and I was like, "What? What does that mean?" Anyways, um, yeah, uh, Cameron, to get rid of voluntary celibates, you have to um, start. All right, so going with the communism, so no woman or man can be strictly to one person. It has to all be spread out evenly. So we're only allowed. You are only allowed, and you must have. One day with one another person every single day. Well, that's not enough because there's a lot of people in the world. Like you have to spend like milliseconds with each person. <laughs> like if you spend a second with each person, then it would take you 
Uh, well, I'm saying it's 180 years to talk to everyone currently alive. This is just within years. your own country right and now. More people are being born. You have to do, you have to work with what you got. You have to be slightly uh, realistic, like, if Kevin, all... even if you're being insane. But you're not communist if you're, if your borders <laughs> end. Like, like, you're not. Think about it. Like, if, if, so, if there's a group that's rich and a group that's poor, and so the communist country decides they must be mm-hmm. one, then if your communist country does well and another communist country does poorly, then you're not actually communist. You're just a bigger <laughs> rich group. So you, 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 you have to all be one. Wow. Right? You, you just made me think of like a radical space race for Star Trek. It's that's sort of like the Borg. You must be one with us so we can be truly communist. Yeah. Like if, Otherwise, a community of six rich people that are billionaires is communist. If, as long as, as, long as like... they equally share it among each other. Yeah. I am completely communist. Me and my ten friends, we share everything. Yeah. We have so much money, it doesn't matter how much we spend of each other's. We just put it all in one big pool and grab handfuls of it whenever we want to yeah. do something. We just have a bucket and a pool boy. Cool, boy. I need six buckets of money. I'm going out into town. Yeah. Ah, thank you. Yes, this this will this will be lovely. Thank you. Yes. Yes. You 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 may take a splash for yourself. Oh, if he takes a splash for himself, it's not you, communism. He has to be allowed to take equal splash. Uh, but he's not part oh, yeah, of the right. group because because they've established. It's like a communist country dealing with another yeah. country. But, but communism, you can't actually end your borders unless you have a rational limit on your communism. It's no longer case. communism! It's no longer communism! <laughs> so, no, therefore, uh, there is no rational which, communism. Or you can just do communism on a smaller scale. Yes. Which which actually can work. There has been towns, like, uh, I think one was called Hope, mm. maybe, and uh, in the States, where there was, like, a, a, a factory mm. town. Uh, you can do it on a, like a citywide scale, and it kind of works occasionally. Sometimes. Uh, it seems like, yeah. You are listening to The Fool and the Philosopher. So I was listening to Dan Carlin recently, and... So free, so are you for uh, freed, free speech, freedom, freedom of action, freedom in general? Are you for I freedom? am for freedom as long as no one gets hurt. Okay, so so I could punch you in the face? That's me getting hurt. Oh, right. Okay. So you can do so you can't do whatever you I'm want. I'm for freedom as long as no one gets hurt. Right. So you can't do whatever That's you want. That's correct. Okay. So what is getting hurt? Um it is what stops you from letting you do what you want to do. Okay. As uh, long as what you want to do doesn't stop anyone else from doing what they want to do. Except they can't do what they want to do because if they hurt you, they yes. can't do it. So, basically, liberty depends on your definition of harm. Yep. So, I, I just thought this was a really... He didn't say this, but it kind of came... Like, so, liberty is depends on your definition yes. of harm. Which I think is a very, very powerful idea. And a a very different way to look at freedom, actually, because you define it in terms of harm, not in terms of freedom. Yes. And what defines harm is uh, so. What Dan Carlin said was, "Your right to swing your fist ends at, at the tip of my yeah. nose." He he was quoting someone else, but he said, "But what if?" But it seems like people are growing longer and longer noses. <laughs> and so that's what he said, and. I I thought about it and I was like, wait, that means that liberty depends on your definition of harm. And if someone has a bigger nose, then so actually you can you can enslave people, let's say. This is extreme, yeah. but if you had the biggest nose in the world, you are the most powerful person. Because no one can hit your nose. Because because you have you have restricted everyone else. Mm-hmm. Uh which is, I'm not saying that like I just thought that was... I, I just thought of that now, but... Um, you can, like... You know, everyone's engulfed in your nose and they can't do anything. It, and, uh... Um... I... This is a brutal part, I think. Um, 
which is um oh that'd be this is a weird one it's a very dangerous edge to walk upon because it actually gives slavery in a different way but um the majority should be allowed to protect themselves yeah and that is something that we have found we disagree with like humanity has agreed basically as a whole that that is not what we think at Mm. all because other if if minorities aren't represented then like that is basically the anti-slavery yeah i know like thought that is enlightenment thought that the minority has to have a has to have others speak for them but that's the Um, mature that's the majority's choice to let them speak Yes, except you can redefine it in terms of everyone being yeah. human, in which case there isn't a minority. So actually, in some ways, that, that is actually really interesting what you said, That because you have two choices uh, to help minorities. You can either say that we are all equal and we are, we are, there is no minorities, we are all human, or the majority can grant the minority protection, in which case the minority's rights are dependent on the majority. Mm-hmm. In which case, the majority actually has power over the minority in giving them their freedom. Yeah, it's like a it's like a a, a dad saying to like, "Oh, you can go out, son, to the party and come back whenever you like." They have granted them that 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 mm-hmm. freedom, and and so it show it's a power dynamic there, which means that they are the superior, even though they they are equally free. One is superior. Yes. So, it has to be that we are all the yeah. same. Which means that we we have to not have minorities, basically, in in uh, that sense. It's, like, there's always going to be like you know, left-handed people are a minority. Like, there's less yeah. left-handed people, but in a terms of they're still people rights, then we have to be we have to redefine it as humans, not not left-handed people's rights yeah. and right-handed people's rights. Otherwise, it's, well, it's just oh, well, I said people. Canada's laws are bad. Yeah. Uh, that's my problems with certain places' laws, um, because c- Canadian law, um, yeah, definitely calls out each group. <laughs> yeah, because um, different groups have different needs, apparently, which could be true. Um, yeah. But which, which I guess is true, but in a rights way, in a rights perspective, you, 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 you can't do that. You just have to say humans all have rights. Basically, to my my thought. Mm. There's there's certain physical factors which are limiting, like male and female definitely have uh, limiting physical factors, and also probably mental factors. Well, sort of. I don't think they do. I think they have averages yeah. that are are fair. Like, I don't think you can define anyone by an average that they. Well, I mean, an av- average of a group okay. they belong so to. Everyone's so everyone's people, right? right like, like, let's go to this country. So everyone's yeah. people. So it's um, in in this one country where we have we've come up with these laws. It's um, legal. It's illegal for people to have abortions, or it's legal for people to have yeah. abortions. Yeah. So how does that extend to a man? Why not? I guess so. Why not give a man the right? That could actually be important. Mutation. There's billions of people. Then mm-hmm. <laughs> why not give everyone that right? <laughs> But why I said um, the majority has to be able to defend themselves is what do you do about, about the guy with the giant nose? Oh, you don't listen to them because they're a whiner, obviously, and you punch them in the nose. <laughs> but what if everyone's noses are growing at the same rate? Yeah. Okay, so so here's the... Th- here, okay, so... Uh, is it harm to call someone a name? I don't see how it could be harm because it does not stop them from doing anything. It does not limit their freedom. What? Okay, I'll get back to that. Is it harm to punch someone lightly on the shoulder? Uh, it doesn't limit them in any way. It doesn't limit their freedom. Okay. But but freedom is determined by harm. Uh, no, harm is determined by freedom. No, because what are you, li- what, what isn't being limited then? Like if, can I punch you in the nose? Um, it's not harming me to do so. You punch me in the nose and then I... In, in pain, I have... I'm not restricting your ability to punch me. No, in but you're restricting my ability to uh, see, to have problems smelling. You're stopping my freedom of... Uh, you're stopping my freedom, basically, to um, do things with my nose. And also, I lose blood, right. so you're restricting my freedom to life. 
So if I stand in front of you in the hallway, I'm restricting your freedom to walk where you want to. My existence actually restricts your freedom. You can't sit in this chair. Um, yes, I guess so. But I can also say, I can judge that um, you're, you were sitting there first. And that you will leave eventually right. and I'll get my turn. And I can also ask you to move. And you will probably do because it's a reasonable thing. Right, but that isn't uh, concrete. That's, I don't know if there can be concreteness. Right, okay. So, now, if you call someone a name and it it causes them to have depression and they lose confidence... Then they are a they wimp because they, they called them a do. name. So, if I punch you in the nose and you can't see, then you're a wimp because you can't just power through the pain. Um... How... So... Do we have to come up with a concrete system, or do we have to come up with levels to everything? I th think that harm isn't... Um, I don't think there's an absolute answer to it. I think that we have to come to an agreement as a society what we deem to be harmful. Yeah, that... And if you have, a, if you have like, a hundred million people say, punching someone in the nose is wrong, but calling them a name is okay, then that, that is what your law is going to have to be, because you just have to come to an mm. agreement. And so if your society agrees that calling someone a name is, is harm, then it is harm. So if your society agrees that walking on the sidewalk is harm? So if you talk about a freedom being restricted, your freedom might not actually be being restricted. Like if, if so this is the idea I had that was so, so powerful and strange to me. It made me think in a different way. If, uh, if there's a law that says you can't say this, I think, wow, that's against free speech. That's mm -hmm. awful. But if you look at it in a different way of causing harm, and harm is arbitrarily defined, then maybe it does cause, cause harm, and maybe it, it... So so it's not actually a matter of, obviously, I'm for free speech. You can actually be for free speech and against words being said. If, if you... Uh... Now, here's the thing. I don't think that words should not be said. However, it doesn't mean that people who do think words can't be said are against free speech. Do you, see, do you kind of see what I'm saying? Uh, what? <laughs> so, no. <laughs> nope. If harm is something that prevents you from yes. doing something, and I say something and it prevents you from doing something, we have already made that concession that your freedom ends where it causes another person to be unable to yep. do something. Therefore, if your words cause someone to be able to, unable to say their own words, then your words are restricting their freedom, and therefore you cannot use those words. Okay. So therefore, you can actually be against words being said and still for free speech. Mm. Because your definition of free speech is just different from my definition of free speech. The idea of freedom or free speech isn't actually defined, absolutely. Uh, yeah, my, my goal, that, I guess my goal is optimum freedom. Yeah, but, but does that idea make sense, whether or not you yes, agree it with it? So I think, okay, so moving on from that, I think because it is determined by the society as mm -hmm. a whole, if you disagree, I think that it has been shown that if you can't say, if you can't say one thing, you can't say anything, yeah. basically. So the risk, it's like you should be allowed to punch people because if all punching was stopped, you could actually have a worse society. You almost need like a little bit of the darkness right. to allow the light to okay. exist. Here, here, Did, here's some. So I think that you should allow complete. So it's kind of like you need the you, without the the uh, the the black dot in the center of the 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 the, the white paisley. You, you can't have the white paisley. Okay, so here, here's the thought. I don't know how it relates to this. In, relates to that, but so. Um, Hitting someone, right? That yes. will, on average, that will hurt people. Okay? Like a certain hit on average will hurt people, right? So yeah. a word, like you say, a, a, a rude word, on average, it will not hurt someone. Okay? Okay. So, but let's say you um, say uh, shaitan in uh, Wheel of Time. That will hurt a lot of people. Like on average, if you say that to someone, that will hurt them. So that is yes. actually a word you can't say. Yeah, and I and I disagree with that. You disagree with that? I th 
I disagree with that. I think that you should not try to protect people fully. I think you have to allow well, not say, the impingement. On- I say not protect people fully, but I'm saying like um, considering the average of whatever something is. Yeah, but I think you actually have to you have to allow a certain amount of people to fall between the cracks to have the the majority <laughs> succeed. Or or maybe a different way is like if there's a word you can't say, then there's there's other words you can't say. So uh, because because the list never gets smaller, mm. right? It, it it just gets bigger. And if you can't punch someone, then like a punch that hurts, right? If you can't harm someone, then you've restricted interaction, you've restricted self defense, you've restricted martial arts sparring. Uh, uh, yeah, you've restricted freedom uh, of, and I don't mean freedom in the sense of freedom we're talking about, I guess, um, or maybe I do. Um, but you've restricted Optimal freedom. No, because that that isn't. <laughs> we we can't have an op- op- freedom. Doesn't really exist. It's it's a. It's not something that's obvious. It, it's it's mm. made up. So if you punch someone, if you, if you take away the ability to punch people, y- you lessen society. Mm. <clears throat> Even though... So does it have to be case by case? Uh, to a certain because degree, you're and I think that's advocating why it, for murder, it seems like to me. If you take away murder, then society's uh, punch, not free. Maybe. Like, I think... So is freedom what we want? Ooh. I think freedom is impossible. I think, like I was trying to say earlier, you need a little bit of the darkness in order to have the light. Like it's like every milligram of of darkness brings with it ten kilograms of light. And so the more darkness you can allow, the more light you get. But once you get, let's say, and then society decides, at one kilogram of darkness we die. So we, we can only have 99 kil, uh, of uh, 999 uh, milligrams. And you, you have to decide, I think, as a society. and What darkness you want? How much you're willing to take to have the, the light. And you need it. Like you, it, it, if you have a perfectly sterile world uh, of pure light, then you, you, you can't do anything. You can't wrestle. You can't... Like, you know, like in The Giver, almost, like, where they, they, their life has no yeah, meaning. Yeah, it's, it's black it's, and white. It's sterile and boring. It. Or but the... maybe, do you think, like, a medieval person would look at us today and say, I want to live like that? Um, I'd say they want to eat like us, but, uh. Yeah, but would you, if you were stuck in a box and it would give you, like, infinite food and health and everything, but you couldn't leave the box or do anything, like, that's not worth it, right? Mm. So even if our health is better... Our lives are longer, and everything. We we're not as free. Yeah. Like we we can't just kill someone for insulting our dog, and we can't, and and we we, we don't have you know we can't just drink brackish water and and pray to God that we, it will be fine. And we it's it's like there's a certain you lose a bit of raw charm every time you you uh, you you improve on something or edit something. Yeah, maybe you. And, and I was wondering about well, that. With, yeah, um, it's basically whenever you take away the dark, which is what you're saying you do, then you also have to lose the light with it. Yeah, and I think you lose more light than you lose dark every time. Like, at, at a certain point, I think it's, like, diminishing yeah. returns. Like, I think, and I don't know which things are which, but you take away, like, uh, um, I don't know, child murder, like mass child murder, and you might lose a tiny bit of light from killing all the devil children, but you, you mostly... <laughs> It's like ninety nine point nine 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 to like a, a thousand places or yeah. more. Good, <laughs> but you take away the ability to say a word that hurts someone's feelings, and you get like, who knows? Maybe it's fifty fifty. Maybe it's like one percent. Maybe who, it's, yeah. And so I guess your averages thing is sort of like yeah. how much are you willing to lose? You have for to decide where the scale balances. But so my, my uh, I guess. The whole point of this, which I said before, but just to restate it, or to restate my point even, saying that you're for free speech and that your opponents aren't doesn't mean anything on its mm-hmm. own. Because just because they want to restrict what you can do doesn't 
mean they are getting rid of freedom. They're just changing the definition of freedom, and freedom's definition can change. Mm. It's not obvious what freedom is. Yeah. It's more of a I know it when I see it, but it's not actually objectively definable. Now, this seems very like moral relativist. Uh, however, my definition of freedom. Yours. Well, okay. That's Your definition of freedom. Well, that's very more is. Brand spanking new, and it's coming to you. Well, mine is the correct one, except I I don't know everything. Mm -hmm. And so that that's where moral relativism fails. It's you don't know everything. So someone else's beliefs might be the ones you want to base yours mm -hmm. in. And that doesn't mean that theirs is right for them and yours is right for you. It means you have to stick, to, you have to uh, trust yourself. When all men doubt you, yeah. have to make allowance for their doubting too, yes. basically. And yeah, so so uh, that liberty isn't. It's so strange. Like li liberty is arbitrary. <laughs> it's it feels wrong to say, but I, I don't see a way around that. It, you have to. It's kind of like the infinite stare. You have to keep walking yeah. the line. And, and maybe maybe that's everything. Like if you if you dig into it deep enough, it's it's kind of like actually you know I think that. So an atom, yeah. right? No, let's say a molecule or a person. You zoom in on a person enough and they become a probability. Yep. So actually everything literally is a lie, a fuzzy line. Yeah. If you zoom okay. in on it enough. And that's why we can't define stuff like liberty and good and yeah. right. And, and that's why going way back to Kant, I found that contradiction unless, <laughs> unless you constantly try to do good. I don't remember what my resolution was, but Kant actually still works, but you have to interpret it in a very strange yeah. way. So. Which might have been his original intent. Um, but black and white literally can't exist because the line between them is fuzzy and it moves. You are listening to The Fool and the Philosopher. So, quantum entanglement. What do you know of it? Yeah. Very All right. little. I know that if you move one thing, the other thing also okay. moves. Okay, yeah, sure. So how could it be useful? Uh, instantaneous information transmission that is 100% secure right. across any distance. Now, well, if I told you we can quantum entangle particles and use them to do quantum entanglement. Uh, I've heard about that, but it was very limited. Okay. It was like short distances and not very stable. Okay, now, here's the problem. So we can actually do quantum entanglement. What you do is you get a particle with a certain amount of momentum, right? So I'm um, like, yeah. let, take take a, um, a object, I guess, um, like a cylinder, and hold it upright and spin it, okay? So it yeah. has that momentum going on. Now, yeah. we... Turn that into two objects at the exact same time. Uh, you have to conserve angular momentum in the universe. However, now that it's two objects, one of them has to be spinning up and one of them has to be spinning down. Sorry, no, I'm wrong. Let me start again. All right, you take an object that's not moving, right? Yeah. And you turn it into a new object, and one of the particles is spinning up. The other one has to spin down to keep angular momentum of the universe because the original object when it divided, wasn't moving. Okay. So, these... That's how magic works in my necromancer book. Okay, so, so these objects are quantum entangled. Yeah. So, um, however... They, so it's, a, it's, a, it's two objects that are still... Yeah, they, they still equal zero. Yeah. Um, however, we don't know which one's spinning up and which one's spinning down. Um, however, once we observe um, the first one spinning up, if we observe... The second one, in the exact same way, it will be spinning down. Right. Now, if we observe the first one spinning up in one, let's say, like, process A, and then we observe the second one spinning down in process B, uh, there's a 50% chance that it will be spinning down or spinning up. So you have to observe them the exact same way, or yeah. there's 
across the board a 50% chance of them spinning randomly. Okay, so now um, the problem with using this is uh, you have to observe the particle to know which way it's spinning. So if I want to communicate to you with quantum communication as far as we can do it right now, I will go, all right, so like I, I have moved this particle to our space and you have this, the other one where you are right now, right? Yeah. And so I observe it and go, hey, it's spinning up. And you know that I observed it this one way. So you observe that way and it's spinning down. That's pointless. We can't get anything out of it because both of us have to observe it for any information to be relevant. And then we have to tell each other that it's spinning those ways through normal communication. Because I had right, I had right. the thought, like, I was wondering, like, why is this so hard to use? Like, why doesn't anyone use it? Like, sure, it's kind of, you can't send any definite signal, but what couldn't you do some sort of binary thing? Like, all right, so I've observed, like, these 20 different particles, and so these other ones will switch on at intervals for you to observe. But no, you have to observe them for them to do anything on both sides. But if your measurements were identical, wouldn't that work? Like, you could just assume that because we are both using the same measuring equipment that it's fine? Yeah, well, no, it is fine. However, we haven't sent any on anything. We've only observed it's doing that one thing, and then we have to check with the other person to say, hey, you observed it. All we're doing is observing it. We're just looking at a spinning thing. Right, but, like, if you move it left, it should move no, it left. No, no, right, uh, right that's right. not, that's, though, they're not quantum entangled in that way. Their quantum, their so spin is, is their quantum entanglement. Okay, and is that the only kind of quantum? That's thing? the only one we know about. Right, which is kind of... Kind of pointless, yes. Uh, it does have one use, which is quantum teleportation, which is uh, you can make very secure transmission. That's about it. You can just do super secure transmission, and you can do some weird stuff in quantum computers, which hurt my brain trying to research. Well, I've got a, I've got a different solution for you since that one didn't work out. Okay. Apparently. So, so I've invented uh, faster than light information. Um, okay. okay? Uh, right. Transmission. Yeah, it's very. It's actually yeah. So you can use this instead. So what? <laughs> okay. So here's what you do. Right. So I am in, at the center of the universe. Okay. Okay. And uh, you and let's say yep. Romney, right, are a light year away from me. You're a light year to my right. Romney's a light year yeah. to my left. So I get out my flashlights. Mm -hmm. I've got a flashlight that shoots a red beam, and i got a flashlight that shoots okay. a blue beam. You and Romney yes. know this. Okay. Flashlights both move the speed mm -hmm. of light. My reflexes are amazing. I turn the flashlights on at the same time. I point the blue flashlight at you and the red flashlight yep. at Romney. Boom. A light year pass. One year yes. passes. Blue light reaches mm -hmm. your eyes. At that instant, you know that a red light shone on Romney. That's the same thing as the quantum... It's not useful! <laughs> <laughs> you can't actually communicate anything with that. that. Yeah, that information traveled the red the time that the red light hit. I already Romney. knew that though. <laughs> no, that's not. The, you already com no, but that that was faster. That was you knew the exact millisecond red light hit someone two light years away. That is that is faster. Yeah, than and with traveled. the quantum entanglement, you can know instantly that this is spinning. Of course, you have to know that Romney hasn't yeah. moved, which you can't. But you can you can you can on faith. <laughs> it's faith based information. Yeah. Okay. Um, so okay, here's the thing. Okay, here I, I I'll fix okay. it though. Okay. If Romney sends me a signal back that the red light yeah. hit his eyes, then I will send you another blue signal. And once that blue signal gets to you, you'll know that the red light previously <laughs> that will take two light Romney. years to afterwards. <laughs> uh, yes, but. The, you will know that the first information was correct and in That's the problem with the... That's literally the problem with the quantum communication. There's a... I think that's that sounds... I just learned... I was reading... It's like this... I, see, I don't know computer program. People that know it will know this by listening to this, but um, there's something called the two armies problem, I believe, yeah. or paradox. And it's the question of two armies have to attack a castle in sync to uh, destroy yeah. it successfully. and the, But they're far away from each other. So how do they attack at the same time? And if one attacks, it'll be destroyed. And then, so they have to attack at exactly the same time. So it's like, well, Army 1 sends a message over to Army 2 and says, okay, attack at 6 p.m. But if Army, 
if the messenger oh yeah also the the tra- the path that the uh, messengers have to take is okay. incredibly dangerous so they're, so they're okay we set the message off so we'll attack at 6 however that messenger might have died so you don't you don't know that the other army is actually going to attack so you need the other army to send you back a message that said yeah we got your message However, that messenger might die. So you need them to say, make sure that you got our messenger, that you got our messenger. Except that messenger might uh. die. <laughs> so, you, so it's actually impossible to solve, except unless you do, like, you kind of break the rules of the game and say, well, okay, what's the chances of the messenger dying? Well, it's uh, 1 in 10. All right, send 500 <laughs> messengers. <laughs> yeah. They got the message. <laughs> the odds are so high that they got the message that we are going yeah. to attack. So there are, like, loopholes around it, but, yeah. Yeah. So there is another... Quantum teleportation is another thing which I was learning about, which is sort of... It's basically how you can make it slightly useful is you can um, force things to spin the way you want them to, and so the other one will spin the way you want it to. So there's always, like... But... um, I guess it's kind of a similar thing, though. There's always a margin for error. Yeah, there's a margin for error with this, with even forcing something to spin... Because you're measuring, and also right. when you force it to spin, the thing that you're forcing it to spin with the information, uh, you have to check with the other person. Yeah, how do you know you? Yeah, so you have right. to check with the other person that you force it to spin right. So it still requires speed of light. However, what it does allow you to do is you can send a very well. It's bas- it's called quantum encryption, and so basically yeah. you can send someone a signal, and then you say, "Did you get a signal like this?" Yeah. And no one can so break actually. That. So you know what you could actually do then? You could use the solution to the, uh, or the solution in quotation marks to the, uh, two armies problem. And you, you force 500 molecules or atoms or whatever mm-hmm. to spin. And it has 500 receptors. And if those 500 receptors, if like any of them, or let's say, uh, 80% receive the spin signal, then you give that as one bit of like, okay, so let, uh, let's it's say a you're, fi- you're it's drawing a 50% chance when you force it. So let's say, but let's say, um, no, you accept. If 80% of my 500 receptors are spinning the same way, then we'll count it as spinning that direction. Okay. Right? So what you do is you send, okay, I span it up. I span 500 molecules yeah. up. So the receiver's like, okay, uh, uh, 400 of my molecules are spinning yeah. it down. Therefore, we will say that they span one up. So then that's one pixel on your screen. So you draw that pixel. And then they send 500 more for your second pixel. So basically, you have to put 500 times the computing power in to send the signal with a, like, what, only a 10, 20, 30, somewhere in there, percent chance of error for each pixel. So It's a 50% think, chance of error for each pixel. Yes, except you have 500 checks on each pixel. Yeah, right? it, you have 500 checks, and each, but it doesn't matter 500 checks because each one will be 50%. Um, as a whole, it's fifty percent chance of the pixel being right or wrong. Wouldn't it be? No, it's because. Wait, why is it only? Why is it only fifty percent? Like, wouldn't is you um... quantum for one? Yeah. No, but but wouldn't you just assume that you're because that means that that your actions are meaningless, doesn't it? Yes, that's what's like. Yes, it... there is no point at all. Then how does the quantum encryption okay, work? Okay, the quantum so encryption like, oh, works, works or it isn't. because you send a speed of light transmission to the person saying, hey, did it spin up? But then that's just a 50% chance to be broken, <laughs> isn't it? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> or does it just fail half the time? <laughs> You're like, okay, once you receive the signal, you can access the I file. I also did completely... Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to send another. I like, didn't completely times. understand it, but it, basically, you can't do you can't do faster of light with um, the spinning spooky action, as far as we know. That's what's called spooky action. I still think that my solution works. <laughs> it just, I, I don't know anything about this, but I like my solution so much that I am. Do you know the, how about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle? Maybe. <laughs> what? what <laughs> ha ha! Do you know what it is? Say it. I do not know what it is. Okay. It is that you cannot know an object's location and place okay. at the same time. Okay, yes, that is right. Then, the... oh, Sorry, it's speed and yeah, that location, is, rather. That <laughs> is the location. problem. Yeah, you can't know it's speed that and location. That is the problem with this quantum communication. 
Or it's, uh, wait, is it direction or the, speed? The Heisenberg um, uncertainty problem is one of the problems with this. In principle. Principle is one of the problems with this whole problem. Because your measurement by nature changes yeah. the, the object. But if, you're, but if your measurement things are identical, then surely you could... Uh, if they're identical, then you're not forcing the object to change. Once you force it to change, to force it to change, you have to introduce a third particle. And this third particle is the bastard. But then, why don't you just have a fourth one? Uh, that would add even more problems. Well, I, but no, you just, um, so you, you have something measured in the particle that interacts as well. And then you can calculate. Of course, any of the other one. But why don't you uh, because get the one? particle that calculates isn't, uh, you, measuring it would be pointless. No, because then if you know. No, no, uh, by, by the very nature it, of this thing. Um, oh yeah, that's why you can't do it. All right. Um, it's quantum cloning is why you can't do it. What, I, what I'm getting at is that you could account for the difference no, but, that your measurement made. Okay, but here's to do so, you need to know the, the measurement difference, which means you need another there, measurement. Which there's a second reason why it doesn't work, though. It's called quantum cloning. Which when is, you send that particle, so when you send this quantum signal, the original particle that you use to help the other one is actually getting sent to the other person as a clone of information, and then the first set gets obliterated. Do you think... Did, we talked about synchronicity yeah. before, right? Do you think you could hijack that to send signals? Like, you could write a letter on a piece of paper and then fold it into an origami scarab, and then have a scarab fly in the window of the person you want to talk to and, and sing your message to them. I have no idea. With the beating of its wings. I have no idea. And I, I am saying this as someone who read, like, five different articles last night. Does that sound like... So, me, like, talking about this stuff, I am... People who try to explain science, I looked at five different people who tried to explain science, and now I'm trying to explain it. Worse than them. So, does that... That sounds like magic, but that could actually be where, where, where technology goes, and that is amazing. The what? The writing a letter on a piece of paper and folding it into a scarab. And then having a scarab wing vibrations like trigger a radio to play your music oh, yeah. or something. Like, like if you could, if hidden variables are a thing, and you can somehow interact yeah. with them, that just so amazing. Well, um, I think that people, and and then you can like start editing reality. Like, oh, I think people sort of go towards editing reality, like quantum tunneling. That seems like the universe cheating, and people are like, okay, how can we use this? Yeah, actually, it's not cheating. It's 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 actually more common sense than than reality. No, it isn't. Sense. It's cheating. It's like if you need the energy to get it, but you'll get the energy by doing it, then just do it the other way around. But we can't do that on a bigger scale. <laughs> well, maybe we can. Maybe we can. We just need it all to line up. But it actually makes quite a bit of common sense. Like, you know, oh, I can't do this unless I do this, but I have to do this first. Well, why don't I just switch the order? That makes way more sense. Yeah. There we go. So, um, oh, the, what did I want to talk about? It was, it was related. Uh, synchronicity technology, quantum tunneling, being cheating. So I, I've, I don't know. I, I've been reading a, a book recently okay. as well. Uh, um, do I care? Um, What's the book? <laughs> I just don't know if I care to talk about it, actually. But anyway, I guess we can edit this out if it's boring. Uh, so I've been reading Can We Be Good Without God? And in an unusual twist for me, it's not... Wait, what just are you marking. doing? <laughs> marking just marking what? to edit out. <laughs> but in an unusual twist yeah. for me, the book is not... You're not, is you're not, not immediately am- agreeing with everything what? and making it your new philosophy? Yeah, which which is remarkable, I think, for me myself. I, I think he uh, he's a very good writer, but I, I I think he's wrong on basically everything. He thinks religion is a way that we explain away things, and it's our way of explaining the universe. And mm. I, I think I think religion is well, okay, a finger I, pointing at the moon. Although he does um he does actually usually mention uh, Joseph Campbell, I believe his name Campbell? is Campbell. It was a Campbell, so you can't really yeah. trust him. But he said, uh, you know, whatever philosophers said that religion is about um, 
explaining natural phenomena. Another one said it's a coping mechanism for life. Another person said it's a way to control mm. people. Another person has said religion is a, a, a moral system, a way of imparting values into the past. Another one said it's a collection of stories. Another one said it's a mm. mythology. It's a history. And he said, what well, these people are all wrong. Religion is all of these mm. things. So, and he does quote that in the book. So maybe it's just like the way he's writing it. Like it's not, like I think he does actually see religion as all of those things. And he's just giving his two cents on which part he's Well, I think in. that uh, a lot of those wrongs, so I think religion is a finger pointing at the moon. Yeah, well, I think it's also those. But people have used it to control people. Well, right? no, you, you're, you're using you the finger to control people. You're... Yes, but the finger is so. religion. So religion... Not, not the, the, God might not mm. be the thing used to control people, and God might not be yeah. this, but God isn't religion. I see. Religion is a way of talking about God, mm. maybe, you could yeah. say. It, and it might not be God, like you can call yeah. it what you will. He, he actually has this really interesting thing in there, though. It's a translation from, uh, the Torah, I believe, about how God, uh, sorry, about how Yahweh took over the council of the gods and became the supreme huh. god well, that's... which i never knew yeah. about <laughs> i thought that was kind of hmm. cool so remember our talk about the digital bible so i wrote yeah. a, um like a short paragraph on that and uh, one of the things they talked about is um maybe the bible is four bars for your cell phone and a rock is one bar you're, you're trying you're talking you can talk to god with both it's just one has better reception so does the di digital Bible have worse? Well, it might. It depends on your belief. Because I was talking about um, the Buddhist perspective of the Tao, and we're all one. Is everything's yeah. God, and so a Buddhist, everything has five bars. Wait a minute. Wait, Buddhists think everything is yep. God. So they think everything is yep. Buddha. Now, if you meet Buddha in the road, mm -hmm. you have to kill him, right? This is Zen Buddhist. I don't know about Buddhists. Why aren't there Buddhist serial killers? Uh, it seems like this, like if you follow the religion logically, you should have to kill everything, uh, and not just living things. <laughs> oh, but I think I understand it, so I have to kill that idea. Whoa. <laughs> uh, so not everything's Buddhist. Buddha's someone who was one with everything. So do you think? So um, if you meet someone who's one with everything, you have to kill them. Well, no. If you if you meet Buddha, yeah. that's different. If you meet Buddha on the road, you have to kill him. Like if you if you find someone that you think is Buddha, then you're wrong, and you get dismiss yes. that idea, dismiss that yeah. notion. If you think you understand Buddhism, dismiss yes. that notion, which is mm -hmm. just someone's way of being really snarky and superior. I think. I think the whole religion is that. It's I just think like, oh no, you don't. No, get it. <laughs> I, I think um, <laughs> I child. think Buddhism <laughs> is a is a joke, but a good joke. It's like Terry Pratchett joke. Well, you think that, but that's not what it is. <laughs> no, it's well, I think a it's way like, of um, expressing that there's inexpressible yeah. truth. Well, I say all I, what I'm trying to say is I think it's like a it's a it's a but it's, it's a not joke. So. <laughs> it's a it's an inside joke. Yeah. But, but it isn't because I'm wrong. I have to kill that notion. Go go, go to Lester Bach actually mathematically explains Zen Buddhism, mm -hmm. and uh, it's kind of amazing. Mm -hmm. And, and, and basically, yeah, it's a way of describing uh, or stating that there are truths that are mm -hmm. unspeakable. Yeah. Because if you say them, they yeah. are true. And and but they are still mm -hmm. true. And uh, but it's not. Yeah. But so, anyways, <laughs> I was saying that um, for like a Christian, a rock it might like God made the rock, but it's not the Bible. So it's like one bar. Whereas a Buddhist is like, yeah, I can talk to God. Well, I, have, I have the best idea for like a, a sketch. By the way, if you ever have to make a movie for one okay. of your classes. So there's like these these two guys in mm -hmm. Rome, right? They walk, they meet like these like Roman peasant yeah. kind of characters, and they're talking a bit. And one of them says something like, "Oh, I'm I'm glad that today is not a hot one. Like I'm thankful that it's yeah. not hot or something." And the other one like raises an eyebrow at him a little bit and like draws like a sort of squiggle mm -hmm. in the dirt. It's kind of like a a, a hook yeah. shape. And the other one looks at it and he kind of appraisingly like draws another hook shape mirrored and it makes like a fish yeah. sort of shape and then the other one like looks at him kind of appraisingly and like draws two legs on it like a like the atheist mm -hmm. thing and then the other guy looks at him and like adds a fin or something mm -hmm. 
And then the other guy adds like a, a, a fishing hook maybe. And it's just like, it's like the classic, like, you know, trying to figure out if someone's yeah. Christian, except it just goes to then to atheist and then to something else and then to something uh. else. <laughs> and, and they're, and they, they're like, are you actually like, they're, they're actually like some religion, like 10 levels up mm. or they're like, who knows? They're like NASA scientists actually, or something at the end. Or, and it's mm. just. And they're like, oh, yeah, okay, so far, so good. So far, so good. So yeah. far, so good. <laughs> just, I, I just thought it was kind of a funny... Right then. You know, it's nineteen to eat, so... Yeah, same. Uh, yeah, well, have a you good too. one, and we'll talk to you. Yes. We'll talk to you soon. Or later. Bye. Or whenever. Bye. 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 Bye.